Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Hey, everybody. Uh, mic's okay, volume? I feel like I'm, feel like I'm loud. Am I loud? It's good? Oh, okay, fantastic. Hey, everybody, my name's Nathan. Uh, I want to talk about the surrealist path and how I create my work. Uh, a couple things up top, though. Uh, you can see my work at Robert Lang Studios here downtown. Uh, I actually, my studio is there, so pretty much whenever the gallery is open, I am there creating. You can stop by, bug me, distract me, you know, take my mind off my things, and uh, you know, maybe swipe a scrap piece of paper while I have a doodle on it or something while you're there. <laughs> I've also done several illustrations working with Scholastic, Boston Publishing, and magazines around the country. Uh, not only have I received a cease and desist letter from the Thomas Kincaid Foundation, I have also received about five rejection letters from New American Paintings. So, you know, I wear those as badge of courage as well. <laughs> what I want to talk about is the blank canvas and how we can conquer it because the blank canvas is beautiful. I, I really do enjoy these, and I want to do them justice every time I work on it. But first, I want to thank you guys for showing up. I feel like it's so early. We all have our socially accepted stimulants in our body, <laughs> and you know, it, it takes a lot to show up for these things, and I appreciate you. Also, uh, this is going to involve a lot of slides, a lot of stock images, and I'm sorry, I know as an artist I should be making my own stuff, but I feel like I can just hop on uh, already created images, and some of them might be some low resolution pics, but just bear with me. And uh, Elon Musk really has nothing to do with my talk, <laughs> but if you Google search stock image, or stock photo, Elon's the first person to show up. I don't know why, but uh, if you want to kill a half hour, just Google search stock photo, and it's a treasure trove. <laughs> Friends don't let friends pose for stock photos. You never know where they're going to end up. Also, take this advice with a grain of salt or a grain of sugar. Uh, I have my path, my way, and I want to share it with you, but it may not agree with you. Or it may. You may have, you may, well, I may be telling you something like, we already know this, but I think it's a lot like encouragement. It needs to be repeated. We're good people. Actually, I appreciate the laughs. <laughs> Others, it may not be your cup of tea and crumpets. But that's okay. There's so many ways to live and discover. And just remember, the world is vast and time is infinite. And no matter what you do, you'll be nothing but a little blip of dust in that huge expanse of time. But so will Elon Musk. So we can all relax. It's all fine. Actually, I, I was thinking about that being the title of my presentation, uh, just for clickbait, but we're moving on now. <laughs> this is me growing up. I was in a constant state of distraction. Uh, I asked my mom to send me an early drawing that I'd done, just so you know where I come from, and apparently... <laughs> Apparently, I was a demon child growing up. <laughs> I attended Savannah College of Art and Design, studying illustration. Woo, got some scaddies out there. Nice. Uh, go scad. Uh, funny story, our, our mascot is the bee for sports, and the idea was that a bee is so big, you don't think it can fly, but it tries really hard. And, and uh, you know, you don't think artists could be athletic, but we try really hard. <laughs> You know, we're still clumsy at it, but, you know, A for effort. I studied illustration, which you, an illustrator, you know, it's all the artwork you see that's not in a gallery. And usually you're interacting with clients, art directors, and they're telling you what to paint, and then you paint it. But when I went out, I decided I wanted to create my own work, and so no one was telling me what to do, and I didn't really know what to create, and I didn't know why I was creating. I had a few ideas, they were well-intended, but then when I tried to recreate them, it never hit the way I thought. I just felt like I was just destroying this idea and not quite representing it right and just doing it a huge disservice. And it, the idea would just die in my eyes. 
And I get so I get so sad and depressed about it that when I come back to this blank canvas, I wouldn't want to create again because why would I want to create another failure that just gets thrown away and I'm embarrassed about? So I employed the advice of our good friend Salvador Dali. Uh, he is sort of a surrealist. He was actually kicked out of the surrealist movement. Uh, the surrealists had this whole ideology and this whole political wing of it that they wanted Dali to be a part of. And Dolly really just wanted to <laughs> throw a lot of parties and make a lot of money. And one of his biggest contributions to the Surrealist movement was the paranoid critical method. And it's really, it's an idea of creating methods to your madness. How can you take this subconscious and project it onto the canvas as something productive? And I'm going to try and explain it to you guys. So the first thing you want to do is take those ideas, those wonderful ideas, and you want to stick them in a field where it's just nice and beautiful, and then forget about them. All right? Your ideas, they're holding you back. They're setting expectations. You have ego associated with your idea. And that, I, that ego, that expectation, is holding you back from creating what you really should do. And plus, the idea probably isn't that good to begin with. We're young. We're stupid. You know, I, you know, in my 20s, it, it, the ideas that I thought in my 20s, I'm looking back at now and I'm just realizing that I really shouldn't be thinking them up in the first place. It just took me 10 years to figure that out. <laughs> so then we go back to the blank canvas and with that, a blank mind. You don't, you shouldn't have an idea, but the great thing about it is that you don't need an idea. You just start creating. And with this, we talk about our brain and this is going to get a little abstract, but pretend your creative energy is divided into three cats. All right, we all on board? All right, strap in. I have like 20 slides with the cats, so there's gonna be, there's gonna be a lot of cat-created content here. Uh, memes. Your first cat's the creator. He is, he or she, it, it. I'm gonna say it. I don't know why I said he. That's, that's an it. Uh, it creates. It's this expulsion of energy. This is actually an automatic drawing done by Salvador Dali. Uh, the automatic drawing is just the idea, you're just scribbling down. You, you, you don't have a clue, you don't have an idea, it's just a bunch of random marks. So your creator, it means well, it's well-intentioned, it's also, it's kind of dim, it, 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 there's, there's, no, there's no sense, it's just creating, just spitballing ideas out. Your second cat is the interpreter. The interpreter has all of your past experiences, your life, your acknowledgments, and it tries to make sense out of what the creator made. So your creator will just make all these abstract shapes and the interpreter will try to pick out what is in those shapes. So obviously we look at these clouds and we see a crocodile laying on its back. <laughs> obviously. Your third cat's the editor. He is the one, it, it is the one, I don't know why I keep saying he. It is the one that corrects you and tries to wrangle everything in and put it down in a pleasing manner. Your editor knows principles of design, it knows color theory, it knows trends, it knows what's going on in the world, and you can keep that cat fed by just reading books, researching, figuring out what's going on. So your cat slices and dices everything that the interpreter made, it'll also correct your spelling, it's fantastic. So then these three cats merge together, and make your super creative machine that creates all your work. So let's begin. You have your creator cat step in, just makes that, just, just, ah, and just a bunch of random marks. So then your interpreter cat steps in and says, what do we think? What do we see? What do we experience? Of course, if it's me and I'm still perpetually seven years old, that's what I see. But I also see someone eating pizza underneath a lamp with a moth flying by. I also see an elephant out in a park. And the editor steps in and says, you know, we like animals, we like parks, this is a good foundation. So we start from here, which is fantastic. First step done, we already have an idea. Now we need to figure out why this elephant is here, what is it doing? Oh, Josh, I forgot the slide. So the editor cleans up using theories of design and line theory. I feel like I just broke the entire flow of this talk because <laughs> I forgot about a slide, but let's keep going. So then the interpreter and the creator step back in. They start thinking up random ideas. So what if, 
you know, the big elephant is a king of elephants and there's a small elephant, this whole Lion King passing off of the crown. Or maybe, you know, the elephant wants to fly up to space so it's unveiling a rocket kit. Or maybe, you know, the elephant's trying to help some rodents climb up and get a tree. You're just, you're just spitballing ideas and you're passing each one off to the editor and the editor is saying, eh, should we go here? No, no. Well, maybe if we combine two ideas, maybe we have something good here, but I think it needs something else. So the editor starts looking online. Let's see if we can find a rodent. When I was, so I was creating this live as I was trying to think about these talks and I thought, you know, an elephant helping squirrels get an acorn from a tree, that's nice, but I don't know if squirrels and elephants are related. Let's see if we can find a rodent in Africa that I can add in. And Google search found, there's an elephant shrew? This exists, this exists. It's a, it's a mouse that looks like an elephant, it's adorable. That, so this elephant shrew becomes the key. This, this is the hook for the painting. This is the hook for the piece. This is why we're creating it. So then, boom, we have an elephant who becomes the leader of the elephant shrews who are helping the shrews collect food. This is our narrative. And boom, we have our painting. And these were the paintings when I was first creating. These are my first pieces. This was an angel's own guardian angel. These were pulled out from abstract shapes. They were very clunky. They were very unrefined but I was creating, I was making, these were finished products, I was moving on. With each piece, I learn, I grow. Here's another, it's the set of scribbles, and I build it up into a final piece. These are nothing, just sets of scribbles. You can see all these different drawings, all these different possibilities, and just slowly slicing them down and editing them, and turning them into final pieces. What's great, I don't need an idea, I, do, I you know, writer's block just, it may take me a little bit longer to get to an idea, but since I don't need an idea to get started, there's nothing holding me back. And hundreds upon hundreds of paintings are created. I'm growing, my creative muscles are getting stronger. And we start exploring different branches. You know, if you start exploring elephant truths exist, maybe you want to give them their own plot line. There's all these different possibilities. And you may think that you know, what if I'm choosing the wrong path? What if, what if I'm going down, there's a demon rabbit at the end of one road? <laughs> We're creating, there is no demon rabbit. There's all these choices. As long as you're choosing, as long as you're exploring paths, you're learning. Even the failures are not failures. Their experiences were growing from them. And you trying to think about which ideas you have is just wasting time. You need to just keep moving. You need to gobble up all these paths. If you keep working, you have all this extra time to explore other things, rather than worrying whether your ideas are good or bad. As I start creating and working, I start venturing down these certain paths. Early on, uh, this was a painting I did back in 2007. Uh, it was a, a character inside this little space pod hanging out with jellyfish. And the idea of people living amongst animals and trying to mimic them and live in their world became this very curious idea that I wanted to keep exploring, which turned into this painting, Sasha's Aria. Now it's a jellyfish trying to, trying to hit on this woman who's living inside a giant submarine and trying to think up narrations and not realizing the majestic and the power of things. And I keep building. And then once I started, I liked this Sasha who has created this submarine and I want to explore her character. So then artwork started to build upon it so now, instead of starting from nothing, I actually have an idea that I'm jumping in through my next paintings. Uh, I loved painting scarves on walruses. <laughs> They're cold and they have long necks. Why don't we give them scarves? <laughs> I started painting scarves and I looking at the weird tusks and I thought, why don't we help their tusks? <laughs> and then I realized, I wasn't actually painting walruses. They looked nothing like this. I was actually painting sea lions. <laughs> and I was just giving them tusks. <laughs> and so now, <laughs> we have a sea lion. It's, I would not have hit this if I have not explored things before. I went on this kick of painting cardinals. I love cardinals. With, with my turquoise backgrounds, having a something red and poppy go against the clouds. It compositionally and color theory, it made sense. 
and also birds are awesome. You know, Portlandia established scientifically. <laughs> they put a bird on it. It's awesome. I started painting couples of birds. And at the time, I was actually corrected that uh, I was painting male cardinals the entire time. <laughs> and without realizing, I was painting a same-sex couple. And not that I was trying, I, I wasn't trying to paint a heterosexual couple, but, uh, and then I realized, hey, there's not enough same-sex couples represented in paintings. And so I started painting animals that had clear male and female, but then creating same-sex couples and exuding love, and then you can see beyond the gender and just focus on the experience. And I would not have gone this, and some of you may think that I've just stumbled on these ideas. <laughs> but yeah, I'm running really fast and I'm not looking where I'm going. I'm gonna stumble into a lot of things. I wanna close with this. Actually, I, I have a talk associated with it. Uh, George Carlin, uh, a beloved comedian, uh, he believed that when you're starting out in your creative field, you're doing what you think you need to do, but that's not what you should be doing. And you need to exhaust yourself of what you think you need to be doing in order to dig down into what you actually should be doing. And so he is famous for every single year he would create all this material, he would release a special, and at the end of the year, he would burn all of his jokes and start fresh and start new. And the idea was that if you keep pushing yourself to create more, eventually you'll tap down into, this, into the good stuff, into the stuff that you really are meant to be doing. Not because people tell you to do it, not because you, you think you should be doing it, but it's the stuff that is true to you. And I really hope that when you start digging and start digging and finding the good stuff, those creative cats that are in your head are now lions. <laughs> Thank you guys very much for hearing me talk. I really appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> uh, Want to talk a little bit about those last slides you wanted to show the crowd? Yeah, uh, I guess. Yeah, uh, Jay, can we cut the... All right, cool. We're cutting the feet on this. Uh Yeah. Anybody have a question for Nick? I have a question. Or Durf? Yes. Uh, <laughs> or I thought you said hors d'oeuvre. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Thomas Kincaid group owes my company a lot of money that isn't being paid, so I feel like we should be like, Oh, oh. <laughs> we should talk. <laughs> <laughs> we should. It's going on, we're going on a couple years now. But we're oh. Gonna oh, my gosh. Well, you, so you're telling me that really famous international corporations don't pay their bills sometimes? I know. We'll talk, we'll talk. Uh, anybody else have a question? Yeah? Hey, um, how, how many meetings do you work on at a time, typically? I typically work between two and six paintings at the same time. Uh, the reasons behind that is A, I work in oils, and so the drying time, uh, if I want to jump back in and correct something, I'll need to uh, need to wait for the oil to dry, so I'll just shift on the next painting. But also, the idea is just keep on swimming, keep on swimming. And if I start getting, if I start slowing down on a certain painting, I'll shift to another. And then when I work on this painting, sometimes paintings will start informing one another, and it's to go with that flow. So yeah. Does your creative process lead into other parts of your life? Like, 
other, uh, other things and that um, blank canvas and the creator and interpreter does that lead into like more mainstream parts of your life yes uh you know it's funny my mantra in life and it's helped me to get over the ego is that uh, i suck uh, but that's okay everything sucks and i need to suck right now so that i suck less in the future so uh i i believe in my head that if you're starting into a new field you're going to fail but that's the point so that you can get over that failure learn from it and start something fresh but that also i'm the worst person to tell that you have this great new idea because I'm going to say, hey, I'm so glad you thought of that idea. That idea probably sucks, but you need, you need to do it, but it's going to suck so that you can figure out why it sucked and then you can move on to the next thing. I'm so positive. I'm, I, I'm a cynical optimist. It's the idea that, you know, every, you know, the world's, cha you know, it's chaos. Be kind. Patton Oswalt. Ah. Also, not letting yourself get out too long. Yes. Uh, you know, that, that was, I was about to go over that in the talk, and I just felt like I, I didn't. Uh, so those three cats, you know, you need to exercise those cats and keep them fed in different ways. The editor cat, you're doing that by reading books, researching, looking at other people's art, re reading color theory. The creative cat, you need to give that cat is a muscle, so you need to exercise it. And I feel like creating is a lot like going to the gym. The first time you create, it's horrible. You hate yourself and you see no results. But if you keep going to that creative gym, your creative muscle will grow stronger. And then you become that very agitated asshole who gets cranky if they're not exercising on a daily basis. And so that sort of that, that asshole is where I want to be creatively. And then lastly is the interpreter you feed that interpreter by living life and gaining experiences and interacting with people because this is an interactive idea. And if you lock yourself into a basement and create day in, day out, you're going to forget why you're creating and you need to learn to love and learn. And so you come up for air and you, even if it's, you know, saying hello or walking down a street, you never walk down in a long while, you know, you need to experience life and look around to help remind you. So that's how you keep those three cats fed and happy. Hi, Nathan. Um, my question is, I hear a lot of artists talk about being influenced by their environment, their external environment, which, which obviously that happens. What is it about Charleston that works for you and your creative, you know, output? Uh, that, is, that is a... Big question. I, I think that because of my method of creation, the outside experiences that I have are put through this big grinder of the psyche. And so there's not like, you can't like say like, oh, this, this is because of this happened. And then, you know, and then I got this ham sandwich. So I did this ham painting. Uh, <laughs> but I think many of the things that has really inspired me about Charleston, it, I, I love it how it's just that perfect size of a city where even if you think you have the entire place mapped out, you can still walk down this weird side street. You know, uh, Philadelphia Alley is my favorite street in Charleston because if you just squint enough, you, th you, think you're, you think you're in Paris. And I love uh, the people in Charleston. And given, you know, as, as Paul said, this, this city has changed so much over the past few years but there's still the same creative people that have been here. And I, I encourage you to find those people and reach out to them. And uh, wait, I didn't answer your question, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, what inspires me about Charleston? It's, you know, the, the low country landscape, one of the biggest connections, if there ever was a connection, the ham sandwich connection, is that the, if you're in the intercoastal waterway and you're just looking out, there's this plain where you see water and you see reeds and then you have the tree line and then you have sky. And it reminds me of a theater stage, a backdrop that someone would make. You have the stage, you have the backdrop, and then you have the lights up top. And if you look at a lot of my work, it has that same sort of planar idea. And so the reality becomes your stage. 
And so that's, that's probably one of the closest inspirations that I pull from Charleston specifically. <laughs> So I really, I think your art's come a long way. I really like a lot of what I, what I saw today. Um, <laughs> if, uh, if, if I wanted to come see it, you said you're at Robert Lane's studio, is that right? Yes. And is Art Walk a good time to <laughs> When is that? What would be a good way for me to come down and, and access, your, access your work? Well, thank you, stranger. <laughs> uh, I work at Robert Lang Studios located on 2 Queen Street. <laughs> you can find me upstairs between the hours of 11 and 5 p.m. Uh, but also, if you have not come to an art walk, it's, it's a gas, it's bring, you, you can go and just enjoy yourself. All the galleries, it becomes a celebration because they're all unveiling new work. You can see the artists stamming around looking nervous together. It's, it's wonderful, and you get to talk with friends about the artwork you see. You get a glass of wine, you move on to the next gallery. It's, it's not so much a sales event, just more of a party. And it takes over the entire street in downtown. And the next one is first Friday in February, so uh, come on down, bring your coat. <laughs> um, we talked about this a little bit yesterday. What are some of the people that might come into your paintings from reality, from inspirations, uh, you know? My wife. <laughs> uh, like, like we mentioned with the Charleston question, you know, my, my experiences in my life kind of goes through that meat grinder and comes out. And it's, it's difficult to sometimes draw lines between uh, who, who is in the painting versus my life. And I try really hard to not use photo references, uh, partially out of laziness that I don't want to take photos of people because that takes time out of creating, but also that I, I, I want the people that are in the stories to come from me. An odd side effect from that is that all my characters look a little bit like me because my face ends up becoming my go-to reference for things because it's only a mirror away. and. So a lot of the characters end up looking like me, but they represent other people. Uh, I did, uh, when I was courting my now wife, uh, going through that stage of first off, I, I wish I had the, the paintings here that I could show you references, but if you come to the studio, these paintings are actually on the wall, located on 2 Queen Street between the hours of 11 and 5. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that I, that I showcased was there's this, there's this boy and he's out in this lake and he's playing guitar, but he's kind of getting a little submerged. And then you see out in this forest in the distance, there is this character in a red cloak. And it kind of became that moment where I thought I had everything figured out, but I was slowly drowning. And this other person comes and finds me where you, and, and kind of pulls me out. And then there's this other painting where the two are going through this forest and the person starts noticing all of these hearts carved out of tree trunks and they're all you know love notes from people in the past and that represents the stage in the relationship where you start unpacking baggage and you start realizing that these aren't ideal people but they're humans with past but then still loving them for everything they've been through and so in that case that's how uh, people end up getting involved in my paintings uh i had geez in, in a more recent I did a painting of this bird in a raincoat and the bird was looking up and it was in the forest and the rain was pouring down and the bird's staring defiantly in the storm. And that was during that, the, the, uh, let's just go on board here, it, during the Kavanaugh hearings and hearing Dr. Leslie Ford, I think her name, in her testimony. And it affected me so much that just seeing her throughout all of this hate and adversity and still looking up. And you see during the testimony, she is looking up and I really wanted to recreate that defiance uh, in the painting. And so I did this painting of a bird looking up in a rainstorm in a forest. And so it, there's threads being connected, but it's going through, it's going through the meat grinder. That, that, I feel like I just, I feel like I just brought the room down with that, but uh, it's what I was feeling at the time, you know? Yeah. It's a lot going on. We got a little bit more time. Does anybody else have any questions for us? I'll keep going. <laughs> How do you know when you need to further iterate or 
further refine what you're thinking about versus doing what Carmen would do and just burn all the jokes and start over. <laughs> uh, were you talking about an individual painting or a whole series I mean, like, I mean, in general? Like, like, hyper macro. Like, 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 oh. When you're thinking about the creative process, because I find what I end up doing is like I'll get stuck on an idea and it's like iterate, iterate, iterate. It's like I'm just looping over it. And at some point, you need a, like, I'm, I work in software, so it's like you need mm -hmm. a break case. It's like, when do you stop doing that? Ah. And I'm just curious as to whether you have found, like, there's a threshold where you're like, all right, you know what? We need to just think, think about something else. We need to walk. We need to, like, use, like, break this particular continuity and find a new one. Yes. Uh, I, I try with each new painting that I create is to, I try really hard to not recreate a painting. So even if um, I was going through that uh, bird, bird phase, boom, I was thinking a bird perched on a branch, how many different ways, how many different characters can I use through this template? And I think I hit close to 50 of just birds on a branch, but go, how many different ways, and just spitballing ideas and have that creator part of myself create all these different things. And so through the process, of changing and altering, you end up going through completely different paths. And so the I, I, I've never consciously said, all right, I need to set this aside and, and go into a completely new direction. But as I'm evolving and shifting, I'm turning into a completely different creature. Uh, another thing, uh, just on individual paintings, uh, I think that there should be a point where usually when I'm like 80% of the way done, I'll make a checklist of what I need to do to complete the painting, and then I do those things, and then I walk away from it. Because you may think that I'm 90, you may, you may think that you're 95% of the way there, but that last 5% is all in your head, and the amount of time it takes for you to get over that last 5% sometimes isn't worth it, and it's better for you to keep creating, working something fresh on the other end. So uh, people tend to ask, you know, how do I know a painting's finished? And and I say that, you know, when it's almost finished is when it's finished. <laughs> oh geez uh yeah i have for, for all of you who are starting out in the creative uh biz uh my heart goes out to you and so do my sympathies uh i you know there's people that say like do what you love and it's like what i love doesn't put food on the table and and uh you start to start saying yes to everything and uh i think right out of college I did a t-shirt for a Mazda enthusiast club. Uh, it, it was awesome. It paid $75. It took me about three weeks to complete. And, uh, all, and I think like in the end, what the client really wanted was a really hyper-realistic Mazda car with a wolf hollowing at the moon on top of it. But he didn't tell me that. He just kept correcting me until I eventually got to that. And uh, yeah, and, and, but the, I, 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 can't say, I can't say say no to these things because you need to create and you need to put food on the table and if those end up overlapping, I think in life, like there's the two spheres, there's what you love to do and what people are willing to pay you to do and you try to find that overlap somewhere. And, uh, and then once you find it, you're like, all right, I, I, just, I just need to keep this going. Awesome. Hey, thank you guys so much. Uh, I don't have any final thoughts, but I, we go on.